It's me, Matthias Hombauer, and this is the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast, episode 72. Always meant going that extra mile, you know, to create something memorable as an image. Show me the way out. You'll get access all area to the best music photographers on the planet, where they share their secrets, successes, and crazy stories from their rockstar life. Join me on this journey kickstart your concert photography career and start living a dream right now. Welcome everybody to a new episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. Today's guest is New Zealand-born and Las Vegas-based music photographer and filmmaker Marianne Bilham. She's an award-winning photographer with 30 years of industry expertise spanning Four continents. Best known for subjects including rock and roll musicians, celebrities, and high end advertising campaigns. Marianne moved to Hong Kong in the mid 80s, where she produced photography campaigns for Asia's top advertising agencies and music companies. When Billham moved to Los Angeles in the mid 90s, she formed the business with husband and rock photographer Robert M. Knight. And you can listen to Robert's interview in episode 71. Highlights for Marianne include the photography campaign for Def Leppard on the Kiss Def Leppard summer tour in 2014. And in 2017, she was commissioned by Sony Legacy to photograph Carlos and Cindy Santana and the Isle Bros for Power of Peace album release. In this interview, Marianne will share her stories as a professional photographer working in New Zealand, Hong Kong and Las Vegas. She will talk about her approach when working with bands directly and why she loves to expand her horizon as a filmmaker. As always, find Marion's photos, her favorite camera equipment and much more on her show notes page at hdbarb.com slash Marianne Bilham. Yeah, so thanks for being a guest on my podcast, Marianne. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Happy to be back home in Vegas um, because I've been on the road pretty much for the last six months with some exciting new projects. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> mainly I've been down in New Zealand um, because Robert and I just launched a new music lounge down there mm -hmm. and uh, just got back from working um, over the last month, actually, uh, mainly during the weekends, uh, with Neil and Mikhail Schoen on the Journey Tour. Cool. Yeah, let's talk about this uh, in a second. So you were working with artists such as Santana, Steve Lukather, and Def Leppard, to name a few. And before we dig into some of your stories, uh, just let me know how everything got started for you as a music photographer. Well, um, early on in my late teenage years, one of my very close good friends um, created uh, one of the original music magazines in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really him, I guess, that inspired me into listening to music by the Ramones and a lot of the bands of that era. Um, I then began an apprenticeship with one of Auckland's leading photographers, mm -hmm. and we started a publication of our own in the arts community, and it was there that I actually started working and photographing a lot of the local musicians okay. um, in the music scene there, and that was in the early 80s. Okay, so you were based in New Zealand. Correct. I'm a New Zealander. Uh, nice to see. Yeah. So I got a lot of um, concert photographers or music photographers from Australia. And I think, I have, yeah, I've won Alexander Halleck. He's based in New Zealand as well on right. my podcast. So what was the biggest challenge when you started out uh, as a music photographer? Was it the technical aspect or getting the access? Uh, I would say more the access in the beginning. 
Um, I mean, the technical part of it because of the sort of training, because I did a um, pretty rigorous apprenticeship in all areas and all formats and, you know, really learned black and white developing and lighting Mm. and all those different areas. So initially it was really making the right kind of alignments um, with the, you know, musicians whose work I really wanted to follow um, and help support and promote. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was definitely getting access to the musicians. And and did you get the access through your magazine or your publication? I did originally. Um, That was really what helped with it. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, I did have a number of like emerging musician friends um, as well, you know, that I would go and support their shows. Okay. Yeah. So... How did this uh, went on then? So you you stayed in New Zealand or you went to another place? Right. So I essentially, I started in my photography career. It was around 1980. In 1983, I moved to Hong Kong mm-hmm. um, with uh, actually an ex well, he was my ex-husband and ex-boyfriend at the time. He was a musician in the New Zealand market, him and his partner, a band called Stung Music. Um, they moved into scoring music for film. Um, so they initially went over there um, for about a month, and then I went over and joined them. Mm-hmm. And it was such a stimulating environment. And, of course, I mean, it was like w- walking into the Blade Runner set, um, mm-hmm. you know, which that film was released at that time. But from, mm-hmm. you know, Auckland was quite a provincial city by comparison to Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong. <laughs> to New York, Asia. Um, So it was quite a mind-blowing experience. And there were so many opportunities there. And so I was fortunate enough because of my own uh, photography business that I started there. And then I had a real alignment with the music industry, um, with their business as well. And so it was through that that I kind of developed, you know, more projects and Mm -hmm. relationships with different musicians and that was a very international city as well Uh, so you had people from all over the world at that time that were coming through there as performers awesome yeah Um, as I said before I think I was three times or four times in Hong Kong as well and uh, I love the city so it's it's so beautiful and uh, I guess nowadays probably all the big stars are also stopping by in Hong Kong was this the case before or was this more a local music scene um, no, actually, Hong Kong, I would say from the period of time that I've been there, you know, always had a pretty international um, mm. scene of musicians coming through it, much more so than, say, New Zealand would have had mm. at that point. It's too far Hong- away for the US bands, right? New Zealand. Probably if well, they tour Australia, then they will get to New Zealand as well. Well, in the last 20 years, New Zealand has become a very popular destination. Mm -hmm. And so most people are always going through New Zealand as well. And they have a lot of really good venues down there, Mm -hmm. you know, in Auckland and Wellington in particular, um, you know, that are like the 10,000-seat arenas. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, Def Leppard are going to be playing down there, you know, in the next two months, and they've actually sold out that show for two nights in a row. Yeah, but like every week now, pretty much, there'll be somebody performing down there. Um, Hong Kong obviously was unique because it was kind of like one of the epicenters of the planet at that time as well, Mm. because it was a free market. Every major corporation in the world just about. Yeah, mm. exactly. So it was kind of a really unique place and time. Um, Michael Hutchins, he was living there. He used to drop wow. by our studio uh, because in excess were actually kind of based in that region as well during the 80s. Okay. Uh, the jazz scene really started to, ve- to develop there as well. Um, I was kind of you know, on the floor in the beginning of Hong Kong's Jazz Club. It was a friend of mine who actually worked for, he was the main guy for Agfa Gavart. Um, he set up the first Hong Kong Jazz Club in mm-hmm. the 80s um, in Lang Kwai Fong, which is quite a famous area there mm. now. Um, so, yes, you know, it was kind of a real interesting sort of renaissance period for a lot of things that were going on. Mm. 
Sounds like an interesting time. Yep, and a lot of opportunities to travel, you know, mm. around Asia as well. Nice. Um, what I can remember, Lama Island was really cool. This was the place where no cars are allowed, right? Yep, that's correct. Mm. It was, I think, about a half-hour um, boat trip from yeah, right. down to Hong Kong. Right, right. And the peak is also amazing. If you go, It's a touristic place, but still. <laughs> yeah, I like no, it with the cable car going up. Yeah, there. and in fact, I lived um, about halfway down. Well, they call it the mid levels area there. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of the area that I lived in um, much of the time that I was in Hong Kong. Nice. So, what were the next steps then when you moved from from Hong Kong to somewhere else? Where okay. Was it? Oh, so you mean after Hong Kong? Right. Where did I right. Okay. So uh, essentially, you know, 1997 was kind of looming in the future. Um, I mean, I had gone through, I mean, watched on TV, you know, what happened with Tinnaman. Um, you know, there were a lot of changes that were starting mm. to happen in Hong Kong. Um, also, you know, the expatriate community, you know, as sort of a smaller one there as well. And I was personally feeling the desire to be able to kind of expand um, mm. into a larger market. Um, so it was, I guess, about um, two years before that move. Robert actually was a person that was kind of influential in that um, because he would always – travel through Hong Kong. Um, mm -hmm. He also did a lot of travel photography as well. Right. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, and I had started on the side of my photographic business, a small stock library, um, which mm -hmm. was very specialized. And uh, I was introduced to Robert. And through that, you know, we developed quite a friendship because we had uh, the whole travel side of things and also the music component as well. And mm -hmm. so we kind of talked about maybe putting a business together. Um, so when the various options were looked at, you know, in like London and Paris and other cities around the world, it became obvious that LA, you know, would be a perfect location mm -hmm. um, given all the musicians and, you know, just what's available there. And so um, after a visit to L.A., um, that ended up being where I moved to next, um, was to Los Angeles, and I formed a business partnership with Robert there. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, you know, he did help me meet, um, you know, certain people in the music industry in the beginning, um, people like Terry Bozio. I did a lot of work with Terry, actually, um, for a lot of his advertising promotions. Uh, Ogre from the band Skinny Puppy. Mm -hmm. I worked actually uh, for American Recordings and did really what were the last um, the last album project, the photography for that um, mm -hmm. before Dwayne, one of the musicians, died. Um, so um, anyway, it was a very you know, kind of fruitful and interesting period of time. And I really loved LA when I first moved there uh, because, you know, there were obviously a lot of new opportunities and it seemed a lot freer than Hong Kong had been. Mm. And I guess all the rocks, or most of the rocks, that's also there, right? Exactly. I mean, pretty much, you know, everybody you could imagine was based there. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, Robert Knight became your husband as well, not only a business partner. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool. So, um, so do you have still the the travel travel agency business nowadays? Well, it was a photo library. A so photo library, a, not travel agency. Yep, sorry. Yep. Yep. It was a um, photo library, and it was a photo library that had photographers. As I say, there was an underwater photographer. Mm -hmm. Robert happened to be in the travel end of it. Um, there was a photographer from New Zealand who was very famous, Andrus Apps, mm -hmm. who had done a lot of large format work like in Patagonia and mm -hmm. um, various different national parks, parks of the world. But um, no – I don't have that anymore. That was just kind okay. of a window in time. And that whole business has completely changed now as I well. See. I yeah. see. 
So, uh, and then you started to, to work with for bands directly, most likely, or uh, were you also shooting for magazines or publications? Uh, yes, so I was shooting for magazines and publications. Um, I was also working for some of the, um, like, Chinese um, music um, companies that were mm -hmm. based there as well. Um, I also did a lot of work for, like, the Academy of Performing Arts. Um, I was working in advertising as well, so I was working okay. for the ad agencies too. Um, as a photographer? So Or? As a photographer, ah. yep. So I did a lot of major campaign work there. Mm. Um, you know, so I had a full fledged photography studio there. Um, and as I say, just on the side of that, that was how I had that photo stock agency mm. uh, that I did. That was kind of an adjunct to working as a photographer in the market there. Um, so I, you know, and a lot of the clients were, you know, international mm. based corporations. Mm. So what would you say is the, the difference between shooting uh, ads or, or doing ads and uh, shooting rock stars? So are there any similarities? Is this totally different from a perspective of a photographer, like doing the shootings, doing the concept and all the stuff? Well, I mean, there's a lot of similarities because, I mean, advertising is really the promotion or the branding, exactly. you know, um, mm -hmm. of some. And because, it, you know, it, you know, even today, I guess more like my expertise that I'm known for is that the artist, the management, um, or the label will approach me, you know, basically to create the imagery from mm. album project, you know, for billboards, for the launch campaign. You mm. know, the House of Blues is a good example of that, you know, for the Santana residency at mm -hmm. the House of Blues. Um, I've worked, I think now he's on to like the fourth um, renewal of that um residency that he's doing okay. there but the first couple you know I got hired to create all the photography for that mm -hmm. and so I mean those are the parameters of advertising because basically you know that's what you're fulfilling for it it's kind of a you know a, a list of fairly strict list of requirements you know mm -hmm. that have to be delivered on the other end of the day photography shoot that you're doing Mm. So can you tell? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Now can can you tell me two um, interesting stories when you have worked with with bands directly? Were there any any ones standing out? Uh, well, one of the more, more memorable ones was the Go Go's. Um, that album cover, God bless the Go Go's. Mm -hmm. uh, which I was responsible for the concepting and photography on. Um, that was shot in 2001, so it was a few years ago. Um, but it was the first album that the Go-Go's had actually released in 17 years. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that album cover. Mm, no, but I will check it but out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a beautifully stylized piece, um, and it represents – Each go go is like a prayer card image, so it's like okay. a religious icon. Um, and I ha had actually a really talented team of stylists and like an amazing backdrop painter and other people that helped, you know, create mm. these um, religious renditions. So, you know, it was a very fun project because it actually kind of took a little while in the pre-production and post-production of it um, and shoot itself with the band um, because I think it was one of the first projects that they had done in quite a few years after having gone through, you know, kind of a more adversarial mm. situation that, you know, really brought them back together again and, it kind of, you know, began – you know, the current day where they're still out on tour, it was like the beginning of the next 15 years. Um, and also being an all female band as well, mm. I really like that aspect of it. And, you know, they're around a similar age to me as well. So, you know, there were a lot of things in it, um, you know, that were kind of important mm. and interesting links for me. 
I see. So because you said um, that you had a great team and stylist and everything, so is this the normal way you're approaching um, like band shooting? Do you have always a team with you, or are you also shooting by yourself, like uh, just one light and the simple simple version, or do you prefer to shoot with the whole team and have all the pre production and and stuff? Um, I pre I prefer shooting with the whole team because that for mm. me is, I guess, part of being a photographer that I really enjoy. Mm. Um, you know, that aspect and being able to, you know, have that collaboration of the other creatives that I like working with as well. Um, I can and I do shoot by myself you know, in a more minimal one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, but when we're kind of referencing more like the album covers, more mm. what we're calling the advertising side of it, that usually is the bigger team. And that seems to be, you know, when people hire me, you know, that's the end game basically mm. that they're looking for to kind of, you know, um, achieve that end goal with it. Um so it's almost like, you know, a video film style production because mm. I always have a few assistants. I like to shoot tethered. I use Capture One mm -hmm. um, as I shoot. Um, you know, obviously my lighting has always been extremely important to me and I'd say that right from the very beginning when I did my apprenticeship, I was fortunate to work with, you know, a master craftsman and lighting as a photographer and that's something you know that's always stayed with me um you know so even when I shoot outside on location you know I'll usually always use some kind of a full flash or mm -hmm. um that's just kind of part of my look you know I like things that are kind of more moody and dramatic as well um you know so lighting often goes into creating that imagery and that feel Mm -hmm. what what company are you using for your lighting do you prefer any well Profoto is mm. the one that I've used now for a number of years um, I used to use brown color a lot which is even more expensive right <laughs> yeah, or? But bronze color actually was where I started I want it yes that, that's all we <laughs> and people might find surprising in New Zealand but we had this amazing brown color set up there mm -hmm. in our studio so that was and then I used a lot of bronze color when I moved to Hong Kong and then actually it's kind of been more in the states now I've ended up working with, with pro photo oh, and wow. I really like the chimera um light mm -hmm. box um, so, and we're fortunate, uh, we have a very good relationship with Shamira, actually, um, one of the reps, um, who was involved with them for many years. She's just kind of semi-retired. Um, but anyway, I have a lot of, you know, light shaping mm. tools I really enjoy working with. Nice. So um, yeah. how do, how do you come up with the uh, inspirations for, for your photo shootings? Um, is the, if a band management contact you do they have already an idea in mind or is it all up to you as a photographer or it depends well, it, i guess it does depend um because it's mixed you know obviously sometimes and now i'll reference like more say with the labels themselves you know they will have a more precise precise vision for the artists Mm -hmm. So then you're kind of working within those parameters and they'll obviously, you know, they have their own art direction department. So then it's kind of more of a collaboration there. But, you know, I have worked with people like John Five, um, who you're probably familiar with mm -hmm. on his solo projects and on those we have together actually come up with the concept ideas okay. Um, for those and you know the one of him levitating over his two guitars I mean that was I guess John Five I like myself is interested in kind of a lot of the arcane areas um, so we have kind of drawn on that area as inspiration um, for the photography you know for those album projects mm. um, and 
you know, the levitation thing obviously went back to like the early 90s, like with the spiritualist society, with people levitating, you know, across the chairs. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of where that idea came from um, for that album cover. I see, I see. Um, What do you think? Did the music business change in a way like uh, I've heard a lot of people said back in the 90s, the music business or the, the major labels spent like one one hundred thousands and millions in uh, pro- producing videos and and uh, yeah promotion for the bands. Do you see any difference nowadays? Do they spend less money, or is it is it still? I mean, if you say that's a big production, you have your team. I guess that's that are really expensive photo shoots for the for the label. Well, they are expensive, but I just say they don't happen as frequently. Okay as they used to. So, I mean, Mm. it's definitely changed. Um, Definitely the size of the budgets. I Mm. mean, obviously quite pared down compared to what they used to be like. Um, You know, so it really all comes down to, I think, you know, existing relationships, you know, Mm. with artists, you know, who still hire you um, for these projects and shoots. Right. Right. But what are your recent projects nowadays? Maybe you can touch yeah, base on one. Yeah, I mean, the last uh, project was the um, working uh, with Journey, um, mm-hmm. you know, this tour series that they've just done with Def Leppard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was on the Las Vegas show at the T Mobile Center here. Um, then covering two shows, um, oh, sorry, one show in San Francisco that was at AT&T Park, mm-hmm. and then the two shows at the Forum in LA. So that was all live photography. I was also shooting some video um, okay. as well on that. Um, I've done that before. Now, both Robert and I worked on this together, actually, because they hired the two of us. Um, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> video side of it is I'll be doing stills like shooting the live show, but I've been shooting like some kind of video sort of behind the scenes um, okay. with them. Um, I did something similar actually, which is up on my website um, because we covered the Indy 500. Um, it was the 100th anniversary that Journey played at about, I think it was three years ago. Okay. Uh, it was in front of a crowd of 100,000 people. Mm. Uh, and we rode him with the motorcade, and I started shooting them with my GoPro, actually, um, okay. you know, all the way in. And then, you know, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and that was kind of, you know, they really loved the film uh, that I put together from that, and I incorporated, you know, some of the stills images um, from the live show as well. Uh, so anyway, that was some of what I was doing, you know, on this um, last project that mm. I just went on with them. Awesome. And, yeah. And you're probably also familiar with uh, Steve Rose and Mike Savoya, or because they yep. they are also uh, they were. working with and- Journey, I guess. Yeah, and I think they were actually out on most of the tour, but mm-hmm. that was kind of the funny thing for us because previously, you know, we've obviously worked, it was just the two of us, um, like the residency when they were here out here in Las Vegas at the Hard Rock at the joint. Uh, anyway, this time there was like a whole gaggle of photographers, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, Because Eric Kabeck was there as well. Uh, But anyway, fortunately, uh, we all know each other and we all get Mm. on well together. So it wasn't like, um, you know, there was any rivalry or anything Mm. like that. But he just kind of worked with her in their own space and, you know, what they were doing. So it was kind of cool. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Sure. This this. This would be my my next question. How important is the the music photography community for you personally? Is this something that you, you know, talk to other guys or do you see it more as a a competition? Uh, Well, I mean, there's certain people and obviously, you know, uh, both, you know, because I've been shooting for 35 years myself. Mm. So, you know, as you go through a space of time, you'll have different 
people, different influences, well, different towns you live in, whatever, you know. So obviously there'll be different photographers that you might be close to, mm. you know, through different periods of time. Um you know, I have always had close friends that were photographers as well. Uh, it is, I would say, in the live music side of things, it does seem to be very competitive. Um, unfortunately, I feel like unless you are being given, uh, you know, more direct access to an artist, mm -hmm that everybody's delivering the same image. So it's a very difficult area to be unique in, you know, because basically a lot of the photo, the stock agencies now, uh, the price point they're selling the imagery for is very low. It mm. isn't what it used to be. And that's mainly because there's so many photographers now you know, that are getting similar area um, imagery. Right, because everyone is standing in the photo pit has the same point of view, probably exactly. use the same equipment, or at least it's almost the same, doesn't matter if you're shooting like on Canon or Sony or whatever. So, so would you say, yeah. so, so w what, what makes the difference then? Uh, well, what makes the difference the is being able to have some kind of unique access to the artist. Mm. Um, now, you know, for me, that probably is more on the commission basis because that for me is a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with an artist right. for a whole day in a very exclusive way. So obviously that exclusivity is what counts. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, as Robert said as well, you know, when you're not just in the pit, you have access backstage, on stage. Uh, you know, that as well gives you an edge that other photographers don't have. Um, you know, unless also you have a very different look in your post-production mm. as well, you know, that's given you something different too. Um, I mean, a lot of people now are really into the whole HD look for live mm. photography. Um, I'm I mean, I don't mind some of that. I personally find it now a bit of a gimmick, you know, because a lot of people are mm. using it. Um, and I feel like it's it's a look that's like a basically a film look, um, which is fine. But it is obviously something that um, can rescue a photograph that may not have been such a great image in the first place. Mm. Yeah, and it seems there are a lot of people who are really good with, with Photoshop and split toning and, and really can rescue like blue or red or green photos. But then I think it's it's coming back what you prefer. I mean, I prefer to, to do the photographs than, or process it black and white than right. uh, being two hours in front of my computer and trying to get the best out of it. But I think this this is what also what you mentioned. You need to find a style and everyone has his own style or... But it's it's hard to find find your own voice because, as you said, also there is we get really similar shots because we're all shooting from the photo pit, and if you don't have the exclusive access and being on stage or getting backstage access, then it's yeah it's getting harder harder and harder to to be and unique. It, it is, and unfortunately, in some situations, you know, because obviously of the cell phone and the iPad mm. and resolution now you'll often see in the pit you know people that shouldn't even be there with those kind with of the devices iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> uh, what would you say um how is the music business for a woman is it what is your experience is it is it different compared if you're a man what do you think um i would say especially from the period of time I started in the music industry um, and as a female photographer mm. you know it's always meant going that extra mile you know to create something memorable as an mm. image um, or, or the actual working experience with a musician because I just feel like that's the way it is for a woman it's like it's, it's a little different. So, mm. I mean, in a 
I think in a good way, a positive way, because you do have to go the extra mile. Um, you know, that really helps you create more as well. Mm, I see. But it's not, uh, I don't think it, I mean, I think it's kind of getting better, but it's not, you know, an equal it's playing equal. field. Mm. Yeah with that because that's just the way it is mm. it's not to say obviously that women you know can have a very prominent voice and you know are very successful but I think it's just a bit more difficult and obviously you know for somebody like myself because I'm more petite and stature as well being in the pit um, you know, if there's a lot of photographers, isn't my favorite place to be <laughs> because they obviously, you know, just draw physical drawbacks mm. with, um, you know, as I say, I've been fortunate because probably over the last 10 years, um, because it's been these exclusive like residencies and things. So there's usually, only a couple of other people in the pit, um, one of them being Robert, and we'll kind of work out like the angles mm. of the stage that we're covering and everything. So it isn't such a problem. Uh, but, you know, you get 20 photographers all in there together, and it is very challenging. So mm. it's not, you know, an optimal environment, mm. um, you know, to be able to cr be creating your best imagery. I see, I see. And so do you and uh, Robert shoot then together, like for the band, and then you, you select the photos from both of you and deliver them? Or is it always like, okay, it, that's Robert's photos and that's your photos? Uh, usually we, you know, we um, sort them out. I mean, you know, they'll have a file of each of our photography. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a business, Night Billum Photography. We have Night Billum Photo. Mm -hmm. um, dot com um which is a joint site you know we both have our own independent um urls as right. well but when we work with artists you know on the live show residencies and that sort of thing yeah we do delineate between the two mm. of us um, and for the most part you know obviously live stuff's a little different because you know you're dealing with the same lighting and everything but you know we are very different you know our styles um you know and the way we shoot as well um mm. so the artists like that you know as well because you know we obviously do see both see things in a different way a different way yeah, yeah. that's great um, do you regret anything in life so far? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, probably not. I think I feel more fortunate, if anything, you know, because of all the travel mm -hmm. um, you know, that I've been able to work with some pretty amazing musicians um, who I consider to be very inspirational people as well. Okay. So I don't really have. I mean, maybe one regret is I would have liked to have um, gone to film school when mm -hmm. I first moved to L.A. Um, to kind of develop my skills more in that area early on um, because it's something now that I'm actually revisiting more as a medium and, you know, it's definitely um, kind of where I see myself going to, you know, in the future in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Uh, to always listen to my intuition. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good one. And with yep. with 20, 20 years old, we might not do it. Uh, when I'm looking back, I don't know. I mean, I knew that I had some intuition, but probably this is something in the older age that you really uh, get to know better and go with it then uh, yeah no, it's true it is well when you do believe in your own judgment more with things mm. definitely mm. so what does success mean for you uh success uh for me is really having the freedom to live in a place that i resonate with um you know, surrounded by supportive friends and family and being able to create 
imagery with, you know, very inspirational artists. Mm. Um, and yeah. so being able to travel and explore new cultures and countries and the world, you know, which I'm still able to do today. Mm. And this sounds like your actual life, right? Yep. But which is great. <laughs> <laughs> which is great. So do you have any dreams or still have any dreams? Uh, yes, I would definitely like to um, publish a beautiful rock and roll music book. Mm. And um, I, you know, really to expand my horizons as a filmmaker and videographer. You know, that's really something that I would like to move into. Um, I did, it was in a different genre, but I did uh, direct um, my first documentary film. Okay. Um, that was in the Philip K. Dick Film Festival last year and won the best biopic. Um, oh, wow, congrats. Thank you. And, you know, I've kind of worked in and out of video and directing now, you know, over the last five years. And so it's definitely just the way I see the future as well um, in visual media. You know, mm. it's really where I would like to go to. Mm. What was the movie about or the documentary? Uh, it was about a gentleman called Ingo Swan, who was a visionary artist um, and one of the people on the forefront of consciousness. He mm -hmm. developed a program called Remote Viewing. Um, he worked for the CIA. Um, okay. He's a very inspirational person. Interesting. I need to watch this documentary yeah. if it's available yeah. online. Yep, yeah, no, I can show it to you. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's do a short q and I'll ask you seven short questions and please answer them as quickly as possible. Nikon or Canon or another brand? Canon. <laughs> Robert is Nikon, right? <laughs> which, which camera model uh, are you using the most? Uh, the 5D Mark III. Okay. If you can only choose one lens for concert photography, which one is it? Uh, the 24 to 105. Okay. Favorite record of all time? Uh, hmm. Tears for Fears, um, Elemental. Okay. Is there any music photographer you admire? Um, Anton Corbin. Mm, I love him too. Yeah, he's amazing. I, I need to get him on the podcast as well. I'm just trying, yeah, sure. trying to find yeah. some contact info. <laughs> uh, your coolest concert you have shot so far? Uh, probably, I think it was around 1996, uh, the U2 concert at Sun Devil Stadium in Phoenix. Okay. Water or beer? Water. And which band is still on your concert photography bucket list? Uh, Depeche Mode. Mm -hmm. And as a last question, which is your must-have tip for someone who wants to start out as a concert photographer nowadays? Uh, to find an, an emerging band um, that they support um, and to work more exclusively with them. Um, but I would always also say not to look at it as a profession uh, mm -hmm. because I think it is very difficult um, in that realm, actually, to be able to survive, you know, solely for somebody young anyway as a music photographer. Mm. And I think you can really lose your passion quickly if you're kind of in this rush that you need to get money to pay your rent and then probably won't make so much fun anymore after, exactly. after a couple of months. So I, I would also suggest to, to yeah, see it as your passion. And a, exactly. It has to be more of a passion right, and, rather and than a passion. Right. And, and if it turns right. out to, to, to be great and it, it's, it's working out for you, then, then it's awesome. But I also think to start, like, see it as your passion, love what you're doing and start from here and don't do it for the money. I guess this is uh, exactly. not, not the, the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Marin, okay. for, for the time. Yeah. was great uh, meeting you here. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you soon somewhere. When you guys are in Vienna, just let me know. 
Oh, that's where you're based. Yes, oh, I'm, I'm in Vienna, Austria. You're living. Right. So if, if you just travel by, oh, let us stop by, let me know. <laughs> we will. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. All the best. Bye. This was a brand new episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. And before you go, I want to say a huge thank you. So here is where you can find me. I am Matthias Hombauer and basically all over the internet. On Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And you will find my blog at www.howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com Share my podcast with your friends. Subscribe to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher or Pocket Casts so that you don't miss any new episodes. And you can also find my free HD Barb podcast app for iOS and Android. I'll publish an interview once a week from the best music photographers on this planet to help you kickstart your concert photography career. And if you're awesome, please leave a review on iTunes. This will make my How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast more visible. And you can actively help to grow our concert photography community. The last place where you can check it out and get some additional value is my newsletter, which is howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com slash VIP. This is where I put content out before it hits my social platforms. So this is sort of the insider track. Leave me comments all over the internet. I'm tracking them down and try to answer every single one. So a huge thank you again for listening to my podcast and I'm looking forward to the next episode. I hope you will join me. In the meantime, go out and shoot some concerts. Rock on, Matthias. <laughs>